Hello, I'm Brett Knowles from PM Squared Consulting. This is an overview of how OKRs can fit into an innovation lab environment. Now, first I should talk about what an OKR is. So, in the simplest form, an OKR is taking an organization's mission and drilling it down to that long-term goals, specific strategic goals that we need to achieve to achieve that long-term mission. And then taking each of those strategic goals and breaking it into these quarterly objectives that we need to accomplish to get those strategic goals done. And then beneath those, the, their key results, what would we have more of or less of, or what are the activities we'll do to contribute to that objective? And then, of course, beneath that, the specific activities you do. And this is that logical breakdown of the strategy. And one of the characteristics that we've noticed is about the timelines. So the mission vision is looking out, you know, five, ten years. These objectives are out looking this year, but often might be in place for several years. Beneath them, of course, these are quarterly objectives and quarterly key results. And then this effectively is what you're doing today. So we're taking this long-term strategy and cascading it to what we do today. Or another way to look at this is I should be able to take a look at my activities as an employee to see if I'm generating the right key results. And we should make sure those key results are contributing to these objectives, which take us to these strategic goals and up to the mission. So whether it's top down or bottom up, we see that connection with the work we do day to day with the overall strategy. And the OKR terminology just comes from this quarterly view, objectives and key results. What we're doing is we're taking a more timely view of strategy as opposed to waiting for the entire year. So we actually call this agile for management because now I get that top down direction from leadership and the bottom up feedback on how we're doing. And this allows the organization to be more agile. So in days like this, when we have more uncertainty, we can cycle this faster and react to market opportunities faster. Now, OKRs are part of what management's concerned of and probably the backbone. So OKRs, objectives and key results, really come from understanding our strategy, seeing how our processes enable the strategy, and from there starting out our OKRs. But you can see this is the backbone to all the things management's concerned about. If we do our work correctly, we can use OKRs to help figure out where we should be doing process improvements and are they giving us those benefits. They can help us chart whether our projects are focused on the right things and giving us the right benefits. They should be able to put our risks into context of the strategy and determine where our risks are and support financial planning. And of course, all of this allows us to better engage and manage work teams and enable compensation and rewards. So OKRs are just a part of, but an important backbone to what management's concerned about. The concepts have been around for a long time. Back in you know, the 50s and 60s, Peter Drucker was talking about MBOs, management by objectives. And the work I was involved in at Harvard in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, took that same body of knowledge and, and updated it to call it the balance scorecard. In fact, we've done the same thing. We've updated that same methodology and called it OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. Now, each of these things are different, but they're pretty much related too. The difference is now we've got way more data than Drucker had in 66. We've got more frequent data. You know, we know what customers are doing moment to moment, not once a year. We've got way better management practices. We've got, you know, MBAs and business skills and you, you go to Barnes and Noble and there are hundreds of yards worth of business textbooks available. We have a faster pace of business. The cadence is much faster now than it was in the 60s. And of course, we have you, a much better workforce. So these updates from MBOs and balance scorecards are appropriate to match what we have to contend with today in business. So I should also just outline what is an OKR. So it's that cascade down to what you do, and we describe it pretty straightforward. Verb, noun, key result, target, date. So let's say that we're working at a, a, a call center, right? We're troubleshooting um, when our customers bump into bugs. So the objective is increase customer productivity, right? We're describing what is the outcome of the work we're doing as measured by what we have more of or less of, in this case, the call to closure cycle time. And currently, we expect the target of four and a half minutes in Q1. So 
verb, noun, key result, target date. Now, we generally want our clients to predict, look into the future. So what's it look like in Q2? What's it look like in Q3? What's it look like in Q4? Now, in this example, you can see a, a miracle happens in Q3. We cut it in half somehow or the other. Well, in this case, they're going to cut it in half by better training the operators. We're going to train the operators that they're certified in more of our products. So the target is in Q2 or Q1, they'll all be trained and certified in two products. By Q2, four products. Q3, six products. And by Q4, 10 products. So HR has a role in contributing to our success. And then we're also going to program the PBX. So when a call comes in, we recognize the phone number. We know what products they have. So I wrote that call to an operator who's certified in the products that that customer owns. So the fact that we are launching that in Q3 combined with the training that gets done by Q3 allows this miracle to happen. So the OKR not only shows what we're doing, but the cross-functional nature of work. And this is super important in an innovation lab where you're depending on other parts of the business like legal, marketing, the agent network to make your work successful. So let's identify where those dependencies are and make them explicit so we can track how we're progressing. Now, this is the standard tile slide talking about the sorts of benefits that we see in innovation labs. Now, some of these are innovation labs from insurance companies, some are from other industries, but you know, all the needles move in the right direction. We see better, you know, customer satisfaction, uh, reduction in the cycle time to get your projects done, more on time, um, milestones, reduced costs and so on. So these are the typical benefits. They obviously change from organization to organization based on your starting point. So, good incentive for doing this. So, now I should move on to what's the process we go through to build OKRs? Because that's kind of the next question, right? Well, what we need to do is capture your area's strategy. And I'll loop back and go into steps one and two in more detail. From the strategy, figure out how do your processes and projects link up to those strategies and contribute to success. From there, we can just build out your OKRs and the linkages to other departments put it into some system of record, and then turn it on. So for most organizations like yours who've been experimenting with OKRs, it's not a long journey. It's pretty straightforward. In fact, it can be as quick as five days. Uh, many organizations take longer as we work it through, but it is a quick journey because we're leveraging off the work you've already done. So I'm going to step you through a case study. Uh, this organization, um, Step one, building the strategy, uh, develop this strategy map. So their overall goal obviously is to achieve financial success. So this innovation lab is bringing product ideas through development into the early part of uh, introducing it to market, you know, past minimum viable product. To achieve financial success, they need to make their target customers happy. To make their customers happy, they need to have the right internal processes. And to have the right internal processes, they need the right enablers. So their overall goal was build, build, build. Build ideas, so come up with ideas for the business, change those into solutions, build solutions that work, and then build businesses, put them into the ecosystem of agents to see um, if it actually can create market demand. Now, financially, they set themselves up with three objectives. They want to maximize the R&D to product conversion rate. So one of the issues was Innovation Labs came up with a bunch of ideas, but not much made it to market. So let's increase that number. Two is obviously just get more revenue from new products. And then thirdly, increase the new product's margin. So once we launch it, we want more and more margin created by these new products. To get there, they're their core objective from the customer base was to let the market choose. So get it out into the marketplace and see which products actually are successful. To do that, there's two things that they wanted to play with. One is scalability. A lot of the development they did was not scalable to what the market demanded. And secondly, they were using a lot of third parties, contractors, you know, people like Accenture were doing coding for them and so on, and they weren't well supported in the ecosystem. So their internal processes were all about accelerating that product development cycle time. And to do that, they set themselves up basically three objectives. Build to build. In other words, create a set of tools that allowed them to build more effectively. Build the whole ecosystem that leveraged marketing, agents, legal, and so forth. And then finally, eliminate friction between the elements. Uh, 
development innovation often causes friction because you're changing the business model and that causes distress. And they were getting caught in the middle of it. Underpinning that was about cultivating the best people, creating a, a new culture, you know, a taste for failure and chaos in an organization that repelled those things. And then finally, use data to vet inspiration. So this isn't meant to be your strategy map, but you can probably see a lot of the work you do in it. This was their strategy map and identified their objectives. The second step is to prioritize these things. So for this organization, they said our priority this year, the highest weighted objectives were cultivating the best people, so we can build to build and build the ecosystem so that we can accelerate their product development and get it to market. So now I can begin to take a look at the activities I do and prioritize them against this strategy. That's step two. So we call this an ontology. And the ontology, the word, word ontology is about the philosophical of, uh, philosoph philosophy of organizing your thing, in this case, your organization. Think of the periodic table. That's the philosophy of organizing molecules. We understand the relationship between neutrons, electrons, and can map out every molecule. The organizing structure for your business is the strategic objectives and weightings down one side, and the activities you do, your core processes across the top. And we should be able to score each process for its impact on the strategy. So in this example, we're scoring out of five. So five is critical, one is minimal, blank is no. So sales said we're critical to the objective of let the market choose. And all we do is we multiply the weighting by the impact to give us um, a conditional formatting here. So for example, two times 20 is 40, that's dark gray. One times 10 is 10, that's light gray. And so from this, we can identify that the critical performance nodes for sales are C1, let the market choose, I3, build the ecosystem, and E1, cultivate our best people. So if we're gonna write our OKRs up, that's where we're gonna write up our OKRs. And this is the technique we use to cull down the number of objectives in your organization. This way we've, we've got them focused on the things that matter. And then secondly, what this allows us to do is to, uh, as the strategy changes through the course of the year, change my OKRs. So let's say the 16% goes down to say uh, three, and this 3% goes up to 16. This black goes away and this one turns black. So now I don't need that OKR anymore and I need to set up a new one here. So in this way, the organization becomes more agile as I can adjust where we need to have our OKRs. And this overall ontology directs us not only into what OKRs I need to build, but how we need to work cross-functionally to ensure the success of our strategy. So this ontology becomes critical to simplifying the OKRs and identifying what are the natural work teams in the organization. So from there, it's straightforward, right? We just need to take those objectives, identify what are the key results, what the targets are, and where we need support from to ensure success. Pretty straightforward, right? And then put it into a system of records like BetterWorks where we have clear visibility of what the entire organization is doing and how it impacts us so that we can begin changing how we manage the business. So that's a quick tour of how it is we set up um, OKRs inside of an innovation lab environment. Now to do this, with a leadership team, we need them for about six hours across the process. They help us create the strategy map and the weightings. Then um, I'm gonna call it an OKR or performance team, does the ontology, builds out the OKRs, lets management review them, uh, refines them, puts them into the system of record and sorts out what is the cadence for our meetings and how we run the meetings and then we launch it. So that's the overall process that we need to take organizations through. So I hope this overview has given you some insights into OKRs, how we develop them, and perhaps some insights into how we can level up your implementation of OKRs to help achieve some of the benefits that we talked about. We hope to talk to you in more detail about your OKR journey as soon as you want to have that conversation. Thanks for your time.